Section 14 of Sunbeams by George W. Peck. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Chaplain and the Bull. An item in an Eau Claire paper speaks of the Reverend Joseph Moran, a preacher of that city, being out on a trout fishing expedition, and the few words therein bring a train of thought in regard to the Reverend Gentleman that causes a smile to come and a tear to chase away the smile. Some years ago, the writer was at Camp Douglas officially, at the time the 1st Wisconsin Regiment was in camp, and among the frequent visitors to headquarters was the chaplain, this Reverend Moran, a great big fellow, like John L. Sullivan, with a heart in him as tender as that of Helen Gould. On duty as chaplain, he was a meek and humble follower of the lowly Saviour preaching words that carried conviction to the hearts of the soldier boys, and made them love him like a brother. Off duty he was a great, good-natured boy, with a laugh that would echo from rock to rock, like a note from a bugle-horn. He would play any game with the boys, and when there was no preaching or playing to be done, he would go off fishing the brooks that run through the meadows and woods for trout. He went out one day to fish, and remained to pray, and never got back to camp until it was too dark for anybody to see the condition his clothes were in. The chaplain was quietly fishing in a field, when suddenly he heard a noise that caused his hair to raise up his hat about eight inches, and being a farmer's boy, he would not mistake the voice of an infuriated bull that was coming towards him at a double quick. Moran took in the situation without difficulty, and started for a tree. He would have preferred a nice smooth birch tree, but the only tree near was a shagbark hickory, the roughest tree to climb, either up or down, that has ever been made. He got to the tree ahead of the bull, but not enough ahead to brag about, and he never did brag about it. The tree was small, and when he had got up above the bull, the tree would bend over, a mere sapling, in fact. The bull was angered at the escape of the chaplain, and pawed the turf and bellowed, but the bull was not as mad as the chaplain was. The whole front of the chaplain's clothes were torn from the loose bark of the tree, but he did not complain as long as the back part had not been torn by the bull. It was a trying situation for three hours. The bull would look up at him and bellow, and Moran would look down at the bull and talk Latin. The bull would rub against the tree, and it would seem as though it would go over. And then he would suddenly get away from it, and the tree would fly back and almost throw the pious rider off. The bull even lay down under the tree to chew his cud, and when he got asleep the chaplain would try to get down and make a run for it, but the noise the tearing clothes would make on the hickory bark would wake the bull, and he would snort and get up and paw the ground. It was after sundown when the bull started off, looking for the farmhouse, and after Moran had seen the animal disappear through the jack pines, he got down with what clothes he could save, and the way he pulled out for camp no bull on earth could have caught him, and he arrived safely among his boys in time for a late supper. The next morning he borrowed a Springfield musket and disappeared into the woods to the north of the camp, and those who saw him wondered what was the trouble. An hour later, when all was still, a shot was heard away off in the distance, a mile away, and a few, who knew of the chaplain's terrible experience, looked at each other and said, It is all over. An hour later the chaplain returned with his gun, and hung it up on the tent pole, and no one who knew him would ask what had happened to the bull. But the next morning a farmer, with a wide hat, whiskers like a bale of hay, and trousers that were uncreased, came to the colonel and complained that one of them dumb recruits had shot one of his cows. A purse was quietly made up, and the farmer was paid, and to this day it is probable the chaplain thinks he killed that bull that held sweet converse with him all that hot afternoon that he was in the hickory tree. Abolishing the School Recess Sometimes it looks as though the school officials 
were overdoing the thing in trying to make the schools of the present day as different as possible from the old schools where the fathers and the grandfathers got their education the last improvement that is suggested by school boards in some places is to do away with the recess in the middle of the forenoon and the middle of the afternoon thus compelling the scholars to stay in the heated schoolroom from nine o'clock in the morning until noon and all the afternoon without a minute of rest if the abolition of the recess does not raise up a race of people with nervous headaches it will be a miracle the old recess good gracious it was the recess that kept the boys and the girls from dying in their tracks did you ever sit in a country school and see the scholars studying and mumbling and reciting with their foreheads wrinkled their eyes strained the perspiration in large drips on their foreheads and an air of depression all over the room presently the eyes turn to the old clock on the wall back of the teacher and there is a faint smile on every face as it is noticed that in five minutes it will be half past ten but each face looks as though it would be a week at least before that minute hand would get around to the mark and as it moved along like a snail it would be seen that all were holding their breath and watching the teacher would she see the clock or would she be so busy she would forget the important event it is half past ten and she makes no move and seems to be deaf and dumb or immersed in some problem in the book before her it is a minute after the time and all eyes are on the clock study has ceased entirely and each scholar acts as though he or she would live just one minute more and if the bell did not ring they would scream the teacher seems dead to the world until some boy who will have cramps if this thing keeps up jumps up and says please teacher may i go out the teacher comes to life and says can't you wait till recess and the boy says he didn't know as they were going to have any recess today and then the teacher looks at the clock says excuse me rings the bell and there is a rush for the door and two minutes of the most valuable time has been wasted there is no class of people on earth that can do more different kinds of things in fifteen minutes than scholars can during a recess the first thing to do is to whoop and yell to clear the lungs and then some wrestle others play marbles climb trees and walk in the shade or run in the sun and get over the ground as though a new world has got to be made in that short fifteen minutes and while they are playing the teacher who has stolen two minutes of the children's time will come out and watch them and be sure to let the recess last the full time and when it is over each scholar wants to be the last to come in as he wanted to be the first to go out ah how many friendships that last through life are made at the school recess the pretty girl is surrounded by her admirers as she will be in society years later and the boy who can be her acknowledged lover is the happiest boy in school while the girls who are not so pretty get as jealous of the favorite as they will when they grow up and are rivals for the hands of the grown-up boys the bullies of the school will get together behind the schoolhouse and talk fight and plan campaigns of slaughter that are never carried out and when they go back to the study room it is easy to study where it was so hard before the recess what can be the matter of these school officials that would cut off the recess have they been disappointed in love or were they never boys themselves the recess in school is like the sherbet served in the middle of a banquet it aids the digestion like the blanched almonds and the celery and the olives if the banqueters sat and ate of the solids all an evening and never had the rest that comes with the etc he would die of apoplexy before the speaking began if the scholar studies all the time until his head whirls his brain will become clogged and some day he will have one long recess at a lunatic asylum where he will yell for all time and the smart aleck who has cut off the recess 
will be to blame for the whole business. Don't try to put on any frills to the old schoolhouse system of education. As well try to run a steam engine without any safety valve as to run a school without a recess, and have an explosion that will blow fool school commissioners and overworked children higher than a kite. When you stop the recess, you might as well seal up the brain and put it in a bottle of alcohol. The boy and the girl have got to have a time to cut the string that holds the cork down and let the wolf howl. THE TURKISH BATH AT HOME The sun desires, at all times, to do all in its power to foster and encourage new enterprises. But it can see many instances where a new invention, or a new style, or a new business, is overdone. And in many new inventions it can see how people are taking too many chances before the new invention has been properly tested and its dangers understood. The sun is brought to these solemn reflections by noticing so many advertisements of these new rubber Turkish bath cabinets in the magazines, which is utilizing the old-fashioned whiskey sweat by which people were supposed to be cured of colds by putting whiskey in a suitable vessel under a cane seat chair, compelling the patient to sit on the chair with a blanket over him and touching a match to the whiskey. One of the most eminent men of our state almost became a burnt offering a quarter of a century ago by the conflagration of half a pint of whiskey, and it is said he has not entirely recovered his presence of mind yet. These pictures of the new rubber baths represent women in all stages of nakedness, sitting in the bath cabinets, perspiring beautifully and an expression on their faces of a burning desire to get well. The sun is no alarmist, but it can see that a tragedy is liable to be enacted some day that will be a burning disgrace, and some good woman is going to discover that burning alcohol under a cane-seat chair is unreliable and far-reaching in its intensity of heat. These baths are being introduced into many families, and they may be all right, if they do not go off half-cocked, when the sitter in the chair does not know they are loaded. Fire is a good servant, but a bad master, as is well known, and some day we expect to hear a still, small voice coming out of a second-story window, yelling murder and fire, and the policeman who answers the call, or the firemen who rush in with a babcock extinguisher and an axe, are going to be shocked, and may be driven downstairs with the broom after the fire has been extinguished. No one need be astonished any day to see a frightened woman with few clothes rushing down the street, covered with one of these rubber bath cabinets, yelling all kinds of murder, and looking for an ice wagon, her white bare feet sticking out of the bottom of the black envelope about nine inches, including an ankle or two, and her face and neck sticking out of the top, the face looking like one of these agonized pictures of before-taking, and a prolonged yell splitting the air, caused by the burning sensation that a newly launched vessel feels when, as the poet says, she lives, she moves, she seems to feel the thrill of life along her keel. Artists who have spent a lifetime painting pictures of women without wearing apparel, for galleries in which the visitor has to look through smoked glass at the pictures to keep from having nervous prostration, assert that woman is never so beautiful as when coming from her bath, with the flush upon her cheek, the mild light in her eye, and the elastic step of youth. But if she emerges from her bathroom with one of these rubber baths attached to her person, and a blue flame coming from the cabinet, and an odor of burning rubber and curled hair, trying to gallop fast, she is not going to appear beautiful. Ordinarily a dog respects and loves a woman, but if a dog met her in that fix, he would be justified in barking, chasing her, and grabbing the rubber bath in his teeth, and then there would be more trouble. Woman is a trusting creature. She often believes what a man tells her, in love affairs, 
and it would not be strange if she had believed what the man who sold her a rubber bath cabinet had said when she asked him if there was any danger of the lamp under the chair blazing up like a skyrocket at a critical time but when men have anything to sell they are often optimistic a woman can have no redress if she goes down to a store where she has bought a bath cabinet limping and sad if she tells the man the thing blazed up and injured her reputation he will tell her that there must be some mistake and that he does not believe her in that case how is she going to demonstrate that she is the injured party the only redress is to have a husband or brother to commit assault and battery on the man who sold the hot proposition to his wife or sister and then he may have to pay a fine that will cost more than the original investment however all the son desires to do is to prepare the people for the inevitable that they may not be scared if called to a neighbor's house at any time to put out a fire that will try all their nerve and to show men that if such an apparition as described earlier in this article appears to them on the street with a warm woman in it they should not jump over a fence and run away but throw their overcoat over her and the cabinet sit down on both put them out and signal an ice wagon or a sprinkling cart women have troubles enough without deliberately dwelling over a lighted alcohol lamp with no fire insurance End of section 14. Recording by Melora.